Korngold's title music for the film Captain Blood, taken from the original 1935 soundtrack. So you didn't go into medicine, George MacDonald Fraser. You went into the army instead, about 1943, I think. Oh, right. And um, you've also written about that in acclaimed memoir um, about your time in Burma called Quartered Safe out here. It's, it's funny... It's also horrifying, and it's also gloriously politically incorrect, uh, a fact of which you're very proud, I think. Well, I am politically incorrect in as much as I am a child of my time, and I don't accept the values which have been imposed in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, so by that, in terms of, of, of war, certainly you mean that your view was an, the only good Jap was a dead one? Yeah. And you describe your jolt of delight in killing your first one. Yes. Uh, well, that was what I was there for. That's what I was trained for. And uh, this is the thing that, that is, is quite difficult, I realise, for the modern generation to understand. They know the Japanese and they work with them and sometimes work for them. Our job was killing them. And it does colour the point of view very much. Mm. And it's it's difficult, I won't say to get that, that out of your head, but it is difficult to make people realise that at that time the world was different and that was necessary. But are you suggesting that people don't go to war today with that same, I suppose, lack of compassion for the enemy? <laughs> the, no, <laughs> to yes, put it well, mildly. Yes, quite. Um, I mean, there had to be a lack of compassion. The war was won by, by ruthlessness, dirty tricks and so on. And you approve of all that? that that's at, that's at right. At that time. But would yes. you approve of it now, people going to war now? With if that kind if of the country was in danger. Mm. Yes. But let's go back to you at war, because again, it seems to me, reading what you've written about it, that not only was, you know, the only good Jap a dead one or whatever, uh, that you were entirely emotionless almost when your colleagues got killed. There seems to be no grief expressed. Oh, that was, that's, that's something which is very different nowadays. You couldn't afford it. I mean, there was no time, as I said in the book, if the Battle of Britain pilots had reacted in the way in which people react to death and destruction nowadays, we'd have lost the war. You what? can't afford to have anything but a stiff upper lip. You can't afford to waste time on regrets. You've just got to get on with it. And what do you feel people do today, then, in those situations? Well, nowadays, it seems to me that, that uh, people don't react quite as, as, as courageously. I mean, when I hear of firemen who get compensation for doing their job, when I hear of counselling of children when a school chum dies. I remember school. You don't approve of that? No. I Why think not? it's extremely bad because it just implants it in their minds. Now, I remember two occasions on which boys in my class died and the master told us about it and we were sorry and that was that. But then we got on with, with life. Now, what do they do? Counselors are called in to tell the children what? How to grieve? This is not good for them. I think you, you put it very succinctly when you talked about uh, what you approved of and what you enjoyed was the cult of the hero, and this is what you might call the cult of the victim. Yes, it is indeed. And the compensation culture, which goes along with it. Uh, well, there are some contradictions there, it seems to me, but I want to come on to them, but let's pause for your third record. Tell me about that one. I served in the border regiment during the war, I'm a Cumbrian by birth, although a Scot. This is a tune that I love. It's one of the, the best regimental marches I know, John Peel. The Royal Gloucestershire Hussars rendition of John Peel. Listening to the story of your life and attitudes uh, so far then, um, George MacDonald Fraser, you'd believe that you would make an excellent soldier, um, brought up on this strong mix oh. of history and so on, and, you know, the, the, the heroism and the Victorian values that you believe in. But the truth is, your, your army career was really rather checkered, wasn't it? Extremely checkered. You know, I, I never thought, I hoped I would be a, a, a reasonable soldier, but it was a, a rather checkered career. I was reduced to the ranks three times, um, having been promoted down to corporal. Why? Uh, the first time uh, I lost a tea urn on a night exercise. The second time I lost a man somewhere in, uh, in the southern Lakeland. 
He turned up later, sleeping under a tree. And the third time I lost a guard room, in as much as I was guard commander at Dulali in India on New Year's Eve 1943, four. And uh, the Royal Scots Fusiliers and the Cameronians stole the large bell tent, which was the, the guard room, while I was asleep. And uh, So you were busted I then? I was busted again. I got my stripe <laughs> back in Burma and uh, managed to hold on to it. You were turned down for a commission, first of I've all? Turned, I'd been turned down for a commission, and then I was approved for a commission after the war. But finally, you threw away the application papers for the permanent commission. You went off the whole caboodle. Right. Why? I'm not... A, I, I realised I wasn't a peacetime soldier. I don't mean that I was, I was sort of some bloodlusting, gung-ho person. I wasn't. But I liked serving during the war. Because you felt you were doing something. Uh, yes, yes there was a purpose to it then. So you went into journalism instead on, on the Carlisle Journal. And right. from there you went to Canada and came back because it snowed too much. And uh, <laughs> then you went to the Cumberland News and eventually the Glasgow Herald. What, what kind of journalist were you? Can you describe uh, it? Well, I was a sports journalist to start with covering Carlisle United, God help me. And uh, the great thing about that was that it was being managed by Bill Shankly. And I've been sort of dining out on that ever since, whenever I meet anybody from Liverpool. <laughs> Very nice man. But you, you went on from sport, presumably. But I went on from sport and did what uh, weekly journalists do, everything. Parish councils, fates, police courts, the lot. I think one of your colleagues was oh. Alistair Burnett, wasn't it? That in Glasgow, Alistair was... Um, sub-editor alongside me. and um, A good lad but daft, you've written. <laughs> That's right. I don't know whether we're into libelous territory. I don't think so. Why was he daft? They, well, he, I, I had a bicycle, and in order to, to uh, uh, make sure it wasn't stolen, I used to take it up four floors in the lift to the sub-editor's room. And I remember Alistair riding it round the sub-editor's room one night. God knows why. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was oh. Graham Greene, wasn't it, who said that... that journalism was the best training for a writer or That's right. something to that effect. Or, or sub-editing, probably. Sub-editing yes. sub on a quality newspaper, on a, I think. That's what he said. And, and that's really what stood you in good stead ultimately, wasn't it? Because oh, you, I, I don't think you, you revise any of your writing. You just sit down and kind of... Uh, I revise it as I go along. I never do a, a second draft, if you know what I mean. You don't reread. No. Do you, have you ever reread any of your books? Yes. I have to have a look at the Flashmans because P.G. Woodhouse uh, once said when he was in the middle of a book, I've written this before. <laughs> and the same thing applies. I've got to make sure that um, I've got to check on his past. Next record, number four. This was um, from my first years in journalism when I met my wife, who was a fellow reporter. Uh, she was on another paper. And... Uh, this really is the song that was popular during our courtship. Fats Waller singing My Very Good Friend the Milk. 